today we're gonna build this lighted, Star Wars inspired Lego minifigure cabinet with a Death Star hallway pattern routed by hand. I don't know about you, but I loved building with Lego as a kid. It scratched the right itch, giving me creative power within a rigid system that I could rely on. But as life moved on, my Lego bricks ended up in storage, forgotten. That is, until my passion for building was reignited when my sons started playing with Lego themselves. As of now, I have a collection of over 70 Star Wars minifigures. They deserve their own display case, but I couldn't find anything that truly captivated me online. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and build one from scratch. To bring my vision to life, I started cutting the parts for the cabinet. Four sides, three shelves, and two back panels. I chose MDF as the material for its excellent paintability. The box joints provide sturdy joinery, ensuring the cabinet's durability. I've already done a deep dive into how I cut box joints with a jig like this in another video, so I've linked that in the corner. Into all four sides, I cut the grooves for the back panels, which will create an interlocking structure. I want this whole case to be strong, and it gains a lot of that strength by having interlocking shelves, panels, and sides. With all four sides clamped together, I can measure the exact size for the back panels and cut them. I'm using quarter inch hardboard for them, which is another engineered MDF product. To prevent the minifigures from moving on the shelves, I carefully cut shallow grooves for modified Lego tiles with a router. These modified tiles are really common and come with most individually packed minifigures. And since the router leaves rounded corners, I used a chisel to get the perfect fit. So far, I've been building a nice display shelf, but I want to add some Star Wars flair to it. For me, one of the most iconic sets in Star Wars is the Death Star. I gathered some reference images before designing the pattern in Adobe Illustrator. To get the design full-sized, I tile printed the pattern onto normal printer paper, then taped the pieces together before taping it to the inner back panel. But that's when I realized something was wrong. My columns weren't perfectly perpendicular to the top and the bottom. I think having to tape pages together threw the pattern out of whack. This panel is supposed to look machine made, so I decided to go another route. I'm not positive, but I think this jig is the first of its kind. It starts with the reference surface for the panel. I used an offcut of hardboard the same thickness as the panel. It will support the bottom edge of the panel as I cut. Two scraps of 3 quarter inch plywood that are longer than the panel is tall become the guides for my trim router to write against it as it cuts. These guides will determine the verticality of the cutouts, so it's really important that these guides are square to the bottom reference edge. I'll constantly check for squareness as I'm building. To get the second guide in place, I'll actually clamp it to my router for a friction fit before screwing it down. This prevents the router from wandering side to side. Now this is only possible with a trim router that has two flat sides to its base. So if yours doesn't, you can just cut a scrap of wood to the exact width of the diameter of your router base and clamp that in between the two guides. And in case it wasn't clear, I attached painter's tape to the sides of the router base just to provide a tiny bit of clearance. One more hardboard offcut supports the far end of the guides. I'll make sure it doesn't touch the panel though. I'm gonna use wedges to lock the panel in place later. Then we can attach two end stops, one on each end of the guides to limit the travel of the router. I lined up the router bit with the end of my line then pressed the stop block up against it before screwing the block down. By the way, if you have a CNC, you can skip all this and just load the vector pattern into your software and start cutting. The main components of the jig are done, but I don't want just one long window. I need to figure out how to get short, repeatable cuts from the router. On the table saw, if you want to get repeatable results, you can use stop blocks, so I thought I'd try that with the router. Since the jig's stop blocks provide the outer bounds, I just need four intermediate blocks that are the four key dimensions. One for the longer cut, one for the shorter cut, one for the space in between each cut, and a final one for the space between the rows. I pulled my measurements directly from Illustrator, and that's one of my design tips. Design in a one-to-one -one scale in your program if you can. Also, if you'd like to use this pattern for yourself, I've left a link in the description below. I set up a stop block on my table saw sled at the right distances to cut all four types of stop block. I also worked out how many blocks I need to fill an entire column, and I'll show you why in a second. After I confirm the right measurements, I cut the correct number of each block. And now that the parts are ready, I'll show you how it all works together. I marked the column spacing at the bottom of the panel, and marked the center line of the router on the jig. 
Once I aligned the first column to the center line, I popped some wedges into place so it won't shift while I'm cutting. Then I loaded up the jig with all of my stop blocks except the one labeled cut number one. I plunged the router into the panel, making the first window with an eighth inch router bit. Although this is eighth inch hardboard, I'll try to make the cut in a couple passes so I don't put too much stress on the bit. Once that window is cut, I'll remove the next two spacers, a small spacer that represents the space between the first and the second window, and the next stop labeled cut number two. To stop the window from behind, we can put the cut number one block and the spacer behind the router. Then I can make the second window cut just like the first. Once that's done, I can remove the next spacer and the cut number three block, then put cut number two and the spacer behind the router. So only cut number three is out of the jig. Then I can make the next window. And so on and so on until the entire column is cut. If this sounds a bit confusing, that's because it can be, without any references. This is the reason I numbered the stop blocks in order, so I could be sure that I had just one out of the jig at any time. Once an entire column is done, I knocked out the wedges and slid the panel over to my next mark. Wedges were added, then I could load up the stop blocks again. However, notice that every other column is flipped. The first goes short long, the second goes long short. To do this, I simply reversed the order of the stop blocks so I'd cut the reverse. This works out because I have even spacing on the top and the bottom of each column. I repeat this over and over again for each column, and the result is this beautiful pattern that looks machine cut. Now that the inner panel is complete, I could finish the interior before gluing the case together. A spray of primer and a hammered bronze top coat gave the inside faces a stylish look. It was right about now that I realized I missed grooves for wiring the lights in the shelves, so I did that really quick with a router. Then I could glue the case together. I painted the outside the same way as the inside faces, but I did a few more coats of primer and a little bit more sanding to get a really smooth surface. Then I wired up the LED strips for the undershelf lighting. This roll is from Amazon, and I like it because it plugs into the wall instead of using batteries. There's a link in the description in case you're interested. Another nice thing about this roll is that it has terminals every few inches where you can cut the strip to make smaller lengths for different uses. I'm cutting strips for the undershelf lighting, as well as a few strips for the back panel. You just wire them back together with thin wire and solder, which is what I'm doing now. A quick test and it's looking great, but it's missing a couple things. To break up the lighting pattern a bit, I added red and white LEDs to make these wall panels. The surrounds are made from plastic clips that I cut, sanded, sprayed, and glued to the inner panel. And a quick note, the LEDs require a resistor on their positive terminal, and you can always tell the positive terminal of an LED because it's longer than the negative terminal. Because the LEDs already have resistors, I can wire them directly to the terminals on a strip. To soften the glow of the back panel lights, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm sticking the light strips to the back of the inner panel. I painted the outer back panel white so the light will reflect off of it and toward the front. Reflected light is softer than spotlighting. To soften it even more, I used a sheet of vellum that I got for about $5 from the art store. But they have it on Amazon, and I've linked that in the description as well. I've used this for shoji lanterns before, and really like how it diffuses the light. I'm just cutting strips that will cover the windows, and I'll affix them with hot glue. I attached the back panel, and the cabinet was ready to shine. And there you have it, an awe-inspiring, Star Wars-inspired display cabinet for your LEGO minifigures. I'm absolutely thrilled with how this turned out, and I hope you are too. This project taught me so much about wiring lights, creating repeatable patterns, and cabinet construction. If you enjoyed this video, I queued another one up right here that I'm sure you'll enjoy. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Bike City Woodworks channel. As long as we can get the